Good morning once again, and welcome to the last session of the National Security Symposium. And uh, we'll have a very important topic on insecurity in Africa, roots, implications, and way forward, to be moderated by Dr. Frederick Golova Mutebi. He's also one of the most uh, active participants that we have. We've had him for close to 10 years, participating in every national security symposium. Uh, Dr. Golova Mutebi is a political scientist and anthropologist. He was educated at Makere University in Uganda and the London School of Economics and Political Science in the United Kingdom. He has taught and researched at Makere University, the University of Witwatersrand in South Africa, and the London School of Economics and Political Science. He has worked on major research programs with different research consortia led by the Overseas Development Institute, Africa Power and Politics Program, Developmental Regimes in Africa. He's also worked um, on several projects in the London School of Economics and Political Science and the University of Manchester. He's currently a research associate at the Overseas Development Institute, Politics, Governance, Research Group, the United Kingdom. He comments on regional affairs in Africa's Great Lakes region for local, regional, and international print and electronic media. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Grover to the podium. Um, today, I have the privilege of chairing uh, this session, which, like those that took place earlier, brings together uh, distinguished and vastly experienced panelists to tell us about and help us think through the very important issue of security in Africa. My pan uh, the panelists and I um, did agree <coughs> on how we are going to conduct this. And one of the things we agreed is that uh, insecurity in Africa is a bit too broad. We are going to try and narrow it and refocus it and make it much more manageable. And so we are going to be looking at challenges uh, to security or security challenges in Africa and we plan to look at this at three uh, levels. First, violent criminality within countries. And here one could give the example for those, I'm sure many in this room are well traveled across the continent. There are countries in Africa where you arrive, in the capitals to be precise, and you're told that there are certain no-go areas in the city. They tell you after dark, don't go here, don't go here. It always suggests that the security establishment have ceded space to criminals. Uh, we would like to look at this and try to think about how things of this kind happen and how they could be prevented or dealt with. We shall also look at intercommunal violence and the causes and drivers behind it. And then lastly, perhaps more importantly, internal and cross-border insurgencies, of which we have so many in Africa. I'm reminded of a panel yesterday when uh, the former agriculture, Minister of Agriculture in Rwanda put up a map where she showed so many African countries in conflict. And that, I think, does point to what is happening across our continent. These are issues that need to be understood, but also uh, solutions to which uh, should be found. So the panelists today are going to help us to think through this <clears throat> and see how these things can be dealt with. Okay, uh, without further ado, 
I would like to invite our panelists to make their opening statements. And now I have the pleasure of inviting Dr. Vincent Virta to give us his opening statement. Let me start by saying that uh, Africa faces a wide array of security <coughs> challenges, including terrorism, insurgency, organized crime, cyber threats, intercommunal conflicts, and many others. And each of these present unique threats to stability and uh, development. The root causes of these security challenges are rooted in factors such as poverty, inequalities, weak governance, and historical grievances, which are oftentimes the result of colonial legacy. So addressing these root causes is essential for long-term solutions, because sometimes we would see that we tend to address consequences of a situation why not really dealing with the root causes. And this is the reason why sometimes a conflict will, will sleep for a few years and resume after some time. This is because sometimes we are just addressing the consequences without dealing, without taking time to address the root causes. Security challenges also often transcend national borders, requiring regional cooperation and coordination. Regional organizations such as uh, the African Union and sub-regional bodies such as the East African Community can play crucial roles in fostering collaboration among <coughs> African states. However, a lack of coordination among these organizations could also be a source of further complications. All these situations, these conflict and persistent security challenges hinder socioeconomic development by disrupting uh, infrastructure projects, deterring investment, and uh, disrupting, uh, displacing communities. This in turn exacerbates poverty and undermines efforts to achieve sustainable development goals, which ultimately will also affect the security situation. Let me recall here that uh, it is the prime responsibility of governments to ensure the safety and security of their citizens. This entails investing in security forces, implementing effective policies, and putting in place laws which assure good governance to address underlying uh, grievances. While government must take the lead in addressing security challenges, international support is also crucial. And these could include capacity building assistance, intelligence sharing, and diplomatic efforts to address cross-border threats. Investing in preventive measures such as education, job creation, and community engagement is also crucial to help addressing the root causes of insecurity and reduce the likelihood of conflict. We need also to be inclusive in the solutions we implement and involve all segments of the society, including women, youth, and marginalized communities, starting from uh, the stage of policy drafting and uh, adopting. Their perspectives and experiences are essential <coughs> for crafting effective and sustainable security policy policies. So addressing security challenges in Africa requires a long-term perspective and sustained commitment from governments, international partners, and civil society. The African Union has put in place some, some structures and policies to address security challenges on the continent. 
and, and I would mention only the African Peace and Security Architecture, whose the Peace and Security Council is the main pillar. Achieving complete security cannot be a quick fix, but is rather a complex and ongoing process. Security cannot be achieved only with the right policies and institutions. It requires constant monitoring and adjustment of measures in place. Thank you, moderator. So here for now. Uh, now could we move on to uh, uh, Mr. Abdullahi, um, uh, the Minister of, uh, of Mali, please. Thank you, moderator. Good morning to everybody. Uh, let me start by, uh, first of all, expressing uh, the full solidarity of the people and the government of Mali uh, with the people of the government and, and, and the, uh, to the people and the government of Rwanda as you are celebrating the 30th anniversary of the genocide against the Tutsi, Tutsi which to some extent also explained very well uh, the topic we are trying to address. Uh, I want also to thank the, the Minister of Defense and the RDF College for extending this invitation to us. And of course, uh, I convey to you greetings from Colonel Asimi Goita, the President of uh, the Transition of Mali. I'm here with uh, General, uh, Brigadier General Aluboy Jara, who I hope could compliment me because I will be speaking maybe at the 30 feet uh, high and maybe with a different perspective. I hope he can take us down to 30 feet so it can provide really concrete reflection. I also want to own uh, all the issues that have been addressed by my brother Vincent Biruta right now. So it's, uh, uh, he talked on some of the issues that I would want to address. So allow me not to come to those one again and to repeat uh, uh, him. Uh, I would like to, to address the topic of the ch security challenges in Africa by sharing some reflections uh, from our own perspective specifically the experience based on the experience of Mali. I want also at the end to share some lessons that Mali has learned uh, throughout the crisis we have gone through for the past 10 years and so. In terms of the challenges, I don't want to go into the detail. I think there are many. They vary from one country to another. And uh, some of the challenges to security in Africa are internal. Some are also external. In terms of the internal challenges, we know we have poverty, unemployment, terrorism, violent extremism, inter-community violence, bad governance, and many other issues. In terms of uh, external, we know uh, colonialism and neocolonialism and imperialism are one of the key drivers to instability and insecurity in Africa. The predation of natural resources is also one of the key points. I think in terms of uh, impact and the challenges of security in Africa, Rwanda is a good exam example because Rwanda, the issues we have gone through, especially the genocide, has not been made in Africa. I think the ideology itself has been imported, developed and executed using uh, foreign forces and also trying to oppose communities who have been living together for centuries. And also, I think the example of Rwanda is quite exemplary because uh, out of this uh, tragedy, Rwanda has emerged as a source of resilience and trying to build a community and unity among the Rwandese. So one of the key challenges, in my view, to Africa security today is the presence of the foreign military on our soil, specifically the foreign military interventions in Africa, which have created chaos and disorder in many countries. I see also the instrumentalization of the regional and international organization, and uh, also uh, the politicization of the human rights issue as a, one of the key problems that we have on the continent. I include also the genocide in that. And if you look at uh, 
this intervention, I will come back to the intervention of Libya in our region, uh, what uh, uh, problems it has created to, uh, into our region. So I will work on that one in particular. But the regional organization today, Vincent talked to the necessity of collaboration among the organization, but we need also to think about what type of regional organization we need in Africa. How can we ensure that the leadership in our regional organization is assumed by Africans themselves and that we are not subjects or we are not proxies for foreign power to achieve their own goal and opposing countries and African citizens. Uh, another challenge also is the geostrategic interests of certain powers trying to make, make Africa the pri private preserve. As we said in France, the chasse garde. This competition also still remains a problem. Uh, France in particular is uh, one of the bad examples that we have because if, even if you, you compare today in Africa the evolution or the political trajectory of Anglophones and Francophone countries, you will see that really Francophone remains still adolescent because uh, they are hardly able to manage their own uh, business. Another key issue I think has been also addressed uh, by the previous panel by Dr. Kaberuka and others is the double standards, and sometimes I will call it even the hypocrisy of uh, specifically uh, international powers, Western powers in particular, if you look at the way they reacted to the Ukraine war is not the same that they did to the crisis in the Sahel, but human life has the same value. So why we, when we were in the G5 Sahel, we spent 10 years looking for 400 uh, million euros, which we didn't get. In Ukraine, I think they spent billions in, in a week. Uh, this is also, even on the human rights issues, we see that really there is a, a double standard in looking at human rights issues, uh, be it in Africa or, or elsewhere, you will clearly see, see what are the difference. But in summary of these uh, uh, causes, I see two main drivers. The first one is the governance, bad governance. I hope uh, uh, Brian and others will come maybe more extensively on that one. And the second one I see is the foreign, uh, foreign interference. Uh, based on Mali's experience, I think we think our major problem has been the NATO intervention in Libya, which in my view has, been, uh, has, been, has not been well think through well prepared, even well executed. For me, it's really a big geostrategic mis mistake to say the few. Otherwise, I think well, the entire region has been drawn in the conflict because we want just to get rid of a leader. But it has been a game changer in our region, to say. It does not mean that we didn't have problems in uh, Sahel or in Western Africa, but the major problem has been that when this intervention occurred, it has destabilized totally what we call the Sahel and Western, West, West Africa for 10 years. And as a consequence, Mali lost about 60% of its territory. We had, uh, I will go forward a bit. We had, as a consequence, the French military intervention in Mali. We have the UN for French intervention, Barkhane. They spent about 2 million euros per day for ten, over 10 years. Uh, UN mission MINUSMA was spending $1 billion, $300 million uh, per year over 10 years. The result is a failure, to be blunt. It was not a success uh, due in part of the lack of sincerity of the partner, specifically France, who has been playing duplicity toward Malians, and also regarding the UN, it was the inadaptation of the peacekeeping force which has been deployed to maintain peace in an area where there is no peace to be kept. I'm quoting the UN Secretary General in its, itself because it, our major threat is an asymmetric threat, not uh, to mediate between two warring parties. So when President Goeta and the team came into the power, they have decided we need to get out of this paradigm, otherwise we will spend the 100 years in this problem. We have decided to go into paradigm shift because mostly the security in Mali for the past 
20 years or so have been built other the foreign presence, which has been a failure, as I said. We say, okay, let's go to the basic to put the security of the Malians in the hands of the Malian. Malians should be responsible for their security, die for the country, preserve the sovereignty and the unity of the country. We have made significant investment uh, in building the capacity of the army, having a new vision for our army, a new strategy. Today we are spending one quarter of our budget in the, uh, in the military because we have no choice. As a consequence today, Mali, who has lost 60% of, of the territory down the road, with our own meager resources, we have been able to retake Kidal, which has been not under the control of the government for the past 10 years, and many other areas. Today, Malians have full control of the territory, and this is also a big success where the major foreign armies didn't succeed. This was also, this paradigm shift is also based on the reaffirmation of the Malian sovereignty, which we resume into three principles. The first one is whatever in our relation with our partners is to respect the sovereignty of Mali, to respect the sovereign choices and the choice of partners of Mali, and to make sure in all decisions uh, the vital interests of the Malian people are looked after and respected. Let me end by sharing with you 10 lessons that we can take from uh, our experience. As I said in the previous panel, no African country should outsource its security to foreign military. That is our responsibility, and no one will help us. No one helped Rwanda during the genocide. You have to deal with it yourself. So it means that Africans, we need to deal with our problem and not to outsource our security to foreign military, which always have its own interests. Second lesson, Africa should develop its own narrative. Be it on terrorism, even on the Sahel, the previous panel was developing the Sahel, but even the conception of the Sahel now is a Western conception. We know the Sahel is 11 countries from Senegal to Somalia. But when they talk about Sahel now, they talk about Mali, Burkina, Niger, and Chad, which is not uh, the case. And second, they see Sahel as a problem. But why these countries are fighting for the Sahel? Because their interests, their geostrategic interests, their resources, even you are from the military, we know the water will be one of the key resources that we'll be fighting for for the uh, upcoming 50 years, more than the oil. But we know the underground water resources in the Sahel are huge, and people are looking for them. Uh, even the conception of the terrorism, I don't have time to develop. Maybe when I receive question, I will come to that one as well. The third lesson is we need to be mindful of the connection between uh, certain Western powers and terrorist groups. In the Sahel, I think very, they are very involved in the constitution and the formation of many of the terrorist groups. I would say even some powers have the remote control because when they decide terrorists will strike in this country, it will come. I think that one is uh, Mali has even a case before the Security Council against a member of the Security Council for this type of, uh, of link. Uh, fourth, uh, fourth lesson, I think, uh, is to take responsibility of our own failure. Everything is not the responsibility of those powers. Where we have the responsibility, we have to admit we have our own issues. We need to go into it and accept it. Uh, the fifth is to provide our own solution. As they said in the previous panel on the economic issues, I think for the security, for the defense of our country, we need to provide our own solution. And also, the sixth lesson is we have to make sure that we are in the position to finance military expenditure based on our own resources, because this is the price of the sovereignty. The seventh lesson is to transform our regional organization and to establish mechanism whose leadership is truly African and shelter from foreign interference. We have established between Mali, Burkina, and Niger, the alliance of the Sahel state. Maybe in the question, if I have time, I can develop this new dynamic to count on ourselves to have an organization which is not funded by others, where the leadership is on our own, and we are also working for the interests of our people. Eight, 
the political and institutional reform are also necessary in rebuilding our states. Uh, following on the previous panel, I think security problems are mainly and foremost economic problems. We need to transform our economic economies to benefit the majority of our people, the majority being women and our youth. This is a national security issue for us. The last issue, the last issue is to get Africa voice, Africa weight, and to make sure that Africa sits at the table. The previous panel was say, saying that Africa should be on the table. No, Africa should be at the table, but as my friend uh, Lumumba said, not as a menu, but Africa has to be the cook. It has to be an ac active cook also to bring the experience of Africa at the table. So I will just stop there. Maybe with the questions, I will be able to develop some of this, these issues, but we have first and foremost to count on ourselves to tackle the security challenges of Africa. Okay, uh, thank you very much, Your Excellency. Um, could we now move on to Dr. Uh, Haji Yanev? <clears throat> Okay, thank you very much. Uh, before I start, I'd like to thank uh, the government of uh, Rwanda and uh, the honorable people of Rwanda that basically we provided maybe this opportunity to come and see how uh, they have risen from uh, ashes and uh, like Phoenix, they actually grew up in their country and I compliment on that. Um, the second, uh, I'd like to also thank the organizers of the conference. But I also have to express that uh, basically uh, my concern, actually, I thought I, I'm going to talk about something, then throughout the conference I saw so many distinguished panelists talking uh, about the issues I wanted to touch upon, uh, which was good, uh, uh, because I also learned a lot from uh, the very good speakers. So, uh, finally, I thought I narrowed down my, my speech on two issues I wanted to address, and then the Honorable Ambassador also touched upon the good governance, which I believe is very important when you talk about security, uh, which left me with one option that I believe it was uh, scratched, but not really addressed, and that's the, how digitalization basically affects uh, the future of security in Africa. Uh, the reason I wanted to talk about this is that uh, this process, I know and I understand, may be far away for now, or you don't see it on the horizon very much, that much, but let me tell you, uh, there are, the problem with digitalizations may be uh, multifold, and I'll uh, just emphasize on two of them. It will come fast until you uh, blink, and then it will also come multi-directional, which means that if you're not prepared, then it will basically enter all of the sectors and it can cause, uh, yes, many benefits for innovation, for, uh, let's say, uh, commodity, for well-being. However, when you put uh, some of the challenges into a security context, then basically that is a serious concern. And here is why. One of the reasons is that basically uh, the digitalization itself uh, has a slightly different concept of the way that statehood is designed. Uh, we know all that uh, uh, the, the, the social contract theory is pretty much top down, it's a vertical, right? So, but the problem with digitalization is more or less it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's okay with some acceptances, it's horizontal. So the governments in digital world are only one player. They are not the only or the top player. They don't have the monopoly of power. They don't, have, they don't pull all the strings. And uh, pretty much the problem is that they don't have concepts ready that basically could be applicable for this. Uh, why it is a problematic? Because it can exploit, if not addressed well, it can exploit all the aspects that may be seen as a threat vectors. And I'll give you an example from a strategic level and going down to a tactical level to just show you how asymmetric it could be. The problem with this, for example, could be that, uh, let's say, we talk about the, like, uh, the violent uh, radicalization of the youth, right? But guess what? Who is digital now? No, it's not the old generation, but the youngsters. They're hungry for the digital world and they live digital. They are the one who picked it up uh, very fast, no matter how 
uh, developed you are or uh, you aren't. So uh, if there is no proper media and information literacy programs that will basically uh, be aligned to the government uh, strategic objectives, that could be a huge problem in radicalization. This doesn't have to be, violent radicalization doesn't have to be always a terrorist. It could also be a huge uh, problem and a challenge uh, that could come actually from the social disparities that digitalization can create. Why? Because again, if it's not addressed well, it can um, deepen uh, existing disparities in the social context. So it could also create a frustration on a long run. Later, it could also bring uh, other aspects, uh, like putting the most of the African countries into what now is, uh, uh, let's say, called a heated geopolitical context. And this context, uh, of course, is played by the big players. And all, as you rightfully uh, uh, underlined throughout the whole forum here, uh, have their own interest. So, uh, with that being said, digitalization could be a good, a good uh, platform for manipulation, for changing the content and owning the content. And uh, you can't actually be more experienced than random people to understand how small radio station could basically drive or be a driver and a threat vector that can instigate violence and it can instigate something which is horrible. Finally, I would say that, let's say, uh, although we may, we may put our you know, defenses, uh, you may, we may uh, build our, uh, invest in our heavy equipment, tanks, etc., etc., but the threat could be that asymmetric because, because it uh, largely reflects the new era or the new changing world that we are facing. In the past, let's say, centuries ago, uh, the one who owned the tools was the most powerful. And sadly and unfortunately, we talked about uh, slavery. Then someone clever says, okay, I'll give you the tools, but I will own the land. We entered the feudalism, right? Then someone clever came and says, okay, I'll give you the land, I'll give you the tools, but I'll keep the capital. Today, my friend, we have um, people that say, okay, I'll give you the land, I'll give you the capital, I'll give you even the tools, and these are the tools, I'll give you the tools, I'll hold the information. So now we are at the, 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 the stage where digitalization empowered individuals to become sovereign and to accumulate power that only in the past was reserved to, um, let's say, states. The problem with this is that the concepts Security concepts that are designed out there and we tend to implement are designed for the nation states and international organizations uh, that they have formed uh, as a subject of these uh, rules, regulations, etc. Not for the objects, because you can't hold objects accountable in this, under these regulations. And the asymmetry now is a very dangerous because uh, accumulating this power they are able now to dictate, uh, to dictate their own policies and their own interests. Put into the, let's say, foreign investments context, put into the critical infrastructure protection context. I understand the logic of you know, uh, outsourcing this because of uh, efficiency, because uh, effectiveness, etc., etc. But the problem here is that most of these individuals or organizations, corporates, are not bound by citizenship or statehood. They are bound by profit. They are bound by their own interests. And this creates uh, infringements in creating policies. So this new world actually allows them unprecedented uh, uh, ability or a trajectory to advance in their strategic ends with, let's say, uh, a uh, a, a very, very short period of time, and they could be able to move uh, things in a, in a very fast, very fast uh, pace and in a great volume. And uh, that means they can mobilize youth, 
they can instigate, let's say, uh, through disinformation, they can instigate asymmetric threats that you will never uh, uh, dream of. Uh, think of, let's say, we talked about with one of my Bulgarian friends here, how influencers can be impactful to youth and how they can, using digital world, using social media platforms, if, you, if there is no right uh, policy in place, how they can affect your security, how they can affect radicalization, how they can affect extremism, how they can affect billions of dollars and euros you have put into, you know, in, attract investments, etc. unless there are right policy in place. And last but not least, let me ask you, and please share with me, I just want to uh, test something. How many of you in the audience there, even wearing a uniform, have the social media, let's say, uh, platforms like, such as WhatsApp for communication? Uh, how many of you? Is there anyone that doesn't have uh, WhatsApp on your phone? Okay. How many of you now, think of this, have set up your app not to download directly the picture if I send the picture to you? Most of the the apps are basically designed when you download them that they put this on your hard disk or, or directly on your phone. Well, guess what? If you're not set up this or not preventing this, you are in a very dangerous, my friends. Why? Because you can be hacked. And this could be a minister, this could be a general, this could be a future minister. If I hacked you and if I collect all the data I want, then that's a power. Unfortunately, the only country in the world now, for now, that has a strategy for data is China. And they are doing it uh, correctly. And I think when addressing, uh, I think it was a few years ago, when Putin was addressing um, uh, youth in Russia, uh, he rightfully said the one who wins uh, the artificial intelligence competition will rule the world. And I'll stop here. Mr. Kagoro, you're next. I think ideally I should say amen and uh, we end the prayer and we go home. Uh, in the last two days, everything that needed to be said has been said. And I think uh, the two ministers and my brother here have said everything that needs to be said. But as often happens, uh, you know, they say that uh, uh, African preachers are the only people who don't know it, when to stop when they're finished. So, uh, so let me anyway um, make some remarks. The uh, greatest challenge to Africa's security remains the dissonance or disconnect between society, which is the generality of the people, the population, Wanainchi, Abaturaje, and those people's basic needs, especially their desire for predictable futures, on the one hand, and the actions and inactions of those with the ability, the legitimacy, and the authority to meet the needs of society. Let me repeat, the greatest challenge to African security remains that fundamental disconnect or dissonance between what the people desire and want and aspire for, which is predictable and secure futures, and the actions or inactions of policymakers, of politicians, and others who have the ability, the legitimacy, and the authority to meet or facilitate those, those needs of society. As a result of the fact that the state, the bureaucracy, and sometimes, yes, the military or securocracy is unable to play this fundamental function, of facilitating and guaranteeing security that enables individuals, communities, and citizens to author their own predictable futures. The people whose needs remain unmet are more and more resorting to self-help in order to meet their needs. The gap created by leadership, the gap created by institutions, the gap created by governance is leading people 
to resort to self-help in order to meet their needs, to secure their futures and the futures of their children. And the state, the African state, that entity with the monopoly over the means of and distribution of violence has failed to protect, to secure, except sometimes the state is very efficient in repressing expressions of poverty or very efficient in protecting a few elites, especially foreign elites. The state never fails to protect multinational companies each time any of their properties or interests are at stake. But the state sometimes grows amnesia when there is a threat to poor people or the poorest of the people. Which means, colleagues, if we're thinking about insecurity, ultimately, there is now a marketplace for and of the means of violence. And the merchants in that marketplace are drawn from various levels of society, including the global. For example, in some of the countries that are listening to me now, they are now local militias or defense units. Sometimes we call them some other names. We have gangs, gangs that control the extraction of gold, gangs that uh, control the extraction of minerals, gangs that control narcotics, gangs included in the trade and trafficking of women and girls. Whether it's Zamazama in South Africa or Makorokoza in Zimbabwe, or what we are seeing uh, in other parts of the continent. Of course, we have national armies and police and intelligence. It's not always clear who or what they are protecting. This is why this debate happening in the context and presence of security officers is clear. And then I think my brother, uh, uh, Minister Diop has referred you to the context of Mali, of the Sahel, and it is the context we're seeing in other parts of the continent, including parts of the Great Lakes and parts of the Horn, where private military companies from America, from France, from wherever, and external special forces are present, constantly assuring us that we are insecure and that they have brought security, but constantly unable to deal with the so-called minor problem of our insecurity. So whole governments and foreign money sometimes is pouring into parts of this continent, whether it's in the Sudan or elsewhere. Money is pouring from foreign governments. That money is not solving the extent of violence it's not solving the insecurity, the forced displacement, but it's pouring. And some of it is being accrued as a debt by the people who are subject of the insecurity. The one thing, though, that as my brother, Minister Diop, will tell you, even in this period of uncertainty on whether a foreign army is present and special forces and private military companies was assuring any form of security, the one thing that remained secure was the gold moving out of our countries unprocessed, was the ore, the critical minerals, were things that were being taken. So I constantly really uh, just come to remind, since these are generals, one has to be respect, a respectful civilian and simply say, esteemed members of the security forces and diplomats, stop sleep walking. Africa's insecurity or insecurity challenges in Africa, often we are then brought into, I call it a Premier League of pettiness, Minister. <laughs> you know, they tell you the reason why these people are fighting is because of tribalism, uh, Islam, Christianity, pastoralism, and etc. I say, ah. And they just started fighting some more the minute you discovered gold, the minute you discovered chrome. The minute you discovered cobalt, somehow tribalism amongst illiterate and semi-literate people in my country has ratcheted up. Hey, my people, book illiterate, chrome literate. Mm -mm, this coincidence does not work well. 
it's important for us to remember that tech and social media is fueling. Is fueling this marketplace of violence, the marketplace of discontent through misinformation and disinformation, as you have said, but also through production of content. So in essence, insecurity is highly diffused, whether you are talking in, at a country level or at a sub-regional or regional level, but also highly interconnected, right? So these violent criminals, whether it's intercommunal violence or internal and cross-border, it's very much interconnected. Which means, and uh, talking to a few generals over tea breaks, everybody appreciates this. Military solutions, guns, bombs, grenades, will not solve as insecurity problem constructed around complex geopolitical, geoeconomic, uh, and also extractivist interests. It essentially means Part of what we have seen African militaries do when they were liberation armies, when they became armies, which is the whole of society approach to security remains the answer. And I liked what you said, Minister Diop. We cannot subcontract or sublet our security to someone else, especially someone else who has an interest in ensuring they are able to get our minerals and our underground water at a price that's affordable or at no price or in exchange for guns and offering security. So we need to understand the society needs better and how society express their needs. I'm always mindful, sir, that when my parents were fighting for the liberation of my country, they were called terrorists. <laughs> and I'm always mindful when it comes to this naming and labeling that we don't end up in an overly simplistic concept of everything being terrorism. The greatest terror caused in our country is often by elites in the bureaucracy, in government, and I dare say it, in security who get into cahoots with foreign interests and are willing to sell their children, great-grandchildren, and grandmothers in exchange for expensive cars, for investments overseas, for little shiny trinket, never factories that produce, never productive economy sectors, but trinkets that distinguish them as natives who did not transcend into understanding economy. I wish to call this what it is. It's not just greed. It's a splendid display of foolishness. Because it seems to me we're exploited on the basis first of ignorance. And Minister, you know, very few African countries have satellites. And even when we collectively, and my elder brother, um, Dr. Kaberuka, will tell you this, when there was a desire to actually ensure that you have your own satellites to help you with all sorts of data of intelligence and also gathering. It was torpedoed by some of our own people who said it's too expensive. And yet for us to understand what's happening in our geospatial space, even underground to know how many or how much minerals we have, we now have to go to those that have the technology. So clearly, how do you do liberation when you depend on funding to do it, you depend on external data to do it, you depend on external expertise to do it, you depend on external technology to do it? I am not saying you should never use external resources and technology. I'm simply saying, if over the next 100 years, there is a desire for a liberated Africa that is truly sovereign, the one terrain of contestation remains. The capacity to produce content and strategic data and have repositories that, where you can store it. I think it was Dr. Kebaruka in the earlier session who talked about the contest over production of genome data. It has now been discovered that the African gene or the black gene is, uh, possesses a lot of solutions to both current and future 
uh, global health challenges. So there is a contest of like, our genes. And we are sitting here. When we ask us where do we invest, we want to build a new parliament building with more seats. We want, come on, people. We can blame colonialism for many things, but I think we need to inspect our own heads. We have high unemployment rates, low productivity rates. We export unbeneficiated goods. We now have accentuated challenges related to poverty and inequality that are dramatized by others who want to exploit us some more. And we faced with this moment, critical moment of leadership, are asked to decide what is important. And what is important is better cars, better buildings. Our priorities insist, sir, that the challenges of insecurity are leadership related. So let me end by looking at two things, because it's important. Uh, three things, right. Colonialism left us with weak institutions, with poor infrastructure, fragmented and divided society, and ideologies of divisionism. Colonialism called it divide and conquer. But in the immediate post-independence, it's divide, loot, divide, decimate, divide, extract, divide, and aid. You create a cyclical dependency, intellectual dependency, economic dependency, political dependency, security dependency. So that when you want to do your own security, you have to go external. When you want to do your own economy, you have to go external. When you want to do your own science, you have to go external. When you want to produce data, you have to go external. Now, uh, tell me something. I am a very proud African, as you know. I have spent the last 30 years preaching Pan-Africanism. Dr. Kaberuka, what is Pan-Africanism without capacity to produce own liberation? What is Pan-Africanism without the capacity to think for yourself, to project the future through science, and etc.? So the arbitrary borders are only a problem and globalization is only a problem because of the challenge. I want to land by saying, when you talked about cyber security, poverty, inequality produces hostility, sometimes hostility even to things that are necessary for one's protection. Let me repeat that. Poverty, inequality, and a sense of exclusion makes people hostile or bandits against their own states, bandits against their own institutions. The outrage that is produced in people who feel excluded. It was the, the, the minister yesterday of security said, are we afraid of the youth? Actually, more fundamentally, do we love ourselves and our countries, our young people, and our futures enough for us to say, Cyber attacks that we are seeing against government institutions. Hackers who are hacking into government critical institutions. And this fact that we remain in, according to the African Union, only 5% of African countries have national cyber security strategies that are implemented and funded. Now, the proliferation of cyber crime. Kenya next door, which is one of the most developed in terms of cyber, had a couple of people sit in a room somewhere who had come in, I don't know whether it's tourists or investors, who were busy creaming off 5% from people's accounts. So this identity theft, online fraud, uh, attacking business, and threatening government stability. But ultimately, these problems are not unique to us. How do we leverage artificial intelligence? My last point, and I know the, the chair wants me now to shut up, Insecurity in Africa is a gendered issue. Let me repeat. Insecurity has very fundamental gender dimension. Women hear me talk about, oh, insecurity because of colonialism, because of foreign powers, insecurity because of uh, governance. But many women in Africa face infanticide and sexual and gender-based violence in homes. They face that violence, my brothers, from ourselves. 
So the insecurity for African women is a multi-layered component. Insecure because they are poor, insecure because of limited levels of education, insecure because some uh, uh, um, negative cultural practices reinforce it, but insecure because patriarchy, the assumed supremacy that we as males exercise has essentially meant that even some police officers are guilty of uh, beating up on their women. So I wanted to remind us gender inequality must be part of the discussion of insecurity so that we are holistic in what we describe. Thank you, Brian. Um, <clears throat> now, you raised the important issue of the disconnect between um, the desires and aspirations of ordinary Africans and the behavior of the people that lead them. <clears throat> now, as a young student, I was a graduate student during that time when certain forms of governance were being sold to Africa, one of which is competitive multipartism. Now, if we agree that since democracy came back to Africa in the late 1980s, early 90s, that we still have governments where this disconnect between the behavior of people in power and the aspirations of their citizens continue, I think that we have a conundrum that we need to resolve. What kind of governance, what kind of governments do we need to correct this? Now, before you answer this, I was recently in a, in, in, in a country led by a monarch, an unelected monarch. And my observations there suggested to me that this is a person who seems to be, or this is a person who leads a government that seems to have its uh, sense of responsibility really well thought out. They seem to do the right thing for their citizens, but they're not elected. Now, in Africa, we have elections, regular elections. But still, the governments we elect do not respond to the aspirations of their citizens. What's the answer to this? And I agree with you that this, this is a cause of insecurity, especially the internal insecurity I mentioned in the form of violent criminality. The apartheid state in South Africa held free, fair, and regular elections where black people were not really included. This is how black people were included. They were asked amongst themselves in a black voter's role to hold their own elections. So technically speaking, if you just are ticking boxes of liberal democracy, apartheid, that evil system, racist system, was a democratic system. In Rhodesia, now Zimbabwe, where I belong, where I was born, the Rhodesian government had an A voter's role, B voter's role, multi-parties, white parties contested for power. The tyranny of this lies in this. You will have people go to the extreme and say democracy doesn't work. No, they are talking about a particular type of democracy. Our people have proverbs. Let me give you one in Shona. Brian, I'm going to have to cut you short. Oh. Um, yeah, no, okay, you want to I'm, as... I'm driving towards thinking about how, no, I, how you address I, this first, situation. Yeah, I hear you, but first, the premise you had used is wrong. So that's why I wanted to debunk it, that if you, if you, if you are saying, if the premise you are using is that we have one system which has performed or not, I'm saying that premise is wrong, historically. For, my, for me, there is a simple issue. Governance has to be inclusive, it has to be participatory. People have to have a voice. But let me say the Shona proverb that you didn't want to hear. It says, The baby that does not cry dies in the mother's, uh, you know the crib we used to carry babies on the back. The idea in our society was always you must create the safety valves to hear what Abaturaje, to hear what Wanainchi, to hear what Abantu want to say a governance system that creates accountability 
and responsibility for those that hold public office with consequences. So it's not enough to elect people. They fool around for five years. They steal. There are no consequences in the system. So the unique and fundamental sense of agency that needs to be brought to African governance is that responsibility and accountability are necessary concomitants of power. Otherwise, we can hold power in perpetuity, do not deliver anything for the citizens, are not accountable for how we use public resources, and are not responsible for the consequences of our dalliance all right. with all sorts of external actors. Okay. Uh, so that's a simple answer. All right. Thank you, Brian. Um, but how do we create accountable governments that do not preside over situations where violent criminality becomes the response? Where, what Brian said, when people are deprived, they create forms of self-help. How do we address this? Now, um, to <clears throat> Dr. Haji uh, Janev, this whole issue of uh, digitalization of artificial um, intelligence, now, increasingly, as other panelists said, um, human rights as an issue has become politicized and instrumentalized. Now, if we agree that, um, say, for instance, social media pose a threat to stability sometimes, we have had instances where governments shut down the internet, say, when, for instance, we are having election campaigns. And that has usually been portrayed as a violation of human rights. We have heard <laughs> where people use, record videos and post them on YouTube with messages that are potentially inciting of violence. And again, when these people are arrested, prosecuted, locked up, governments are condemned for violating human rights. How does one deal with situations like this to prevent potential threats to stability? Uh, what I think is uh, important, and that goes against the governance, good governance, which basically needs to nurture a good leadership. And uh, when, I, when I run a go good governance in a social security reform, I try to use a comparison and I try to simplify things because sometimes I work with the people that need simple answers. And I, I use this example. Take Lord of the Rings. It's a nice book, right? It's about the ring. Consider the ring as the power of, of governance, right? Everybody around Frodo, who is the, you know, the promised guy that will basically not be diluted by the, 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 the evil power of power, uh, is good. So we have a lot of good people, right? But all of the sudden, we all bear our weaknesses because we have all our prejudice. So the investment is in the future. And if you don't develop, and if you don't start building uh, proper, let's say, policies that they'll, they'll invest in the future leaders, they, and we to protect them with good governance, focusing on transparency, accountability, effectiveness, and efficiency, we are not going to succeed. Why I say we? Because what I, when I hear you, I hear most of our, I, I come from Southeastern Europe, I, the same, totally the same issues. Problems with identity, problems with uh, outsourcing our policy, problem with outsourcing the, the uh, in, what I call engineering democracy. <clears throat> when you manipulate, when you engineer democracy, when you say, yes, it's democratic. Problems with double standards. When you say, okay, we'll care about, uh, let's say, human rights up until, let's say, it comes to the certain interest where we will put the, 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 now the emphasis on security. We'll trade, in, in Europe now, they call stabilitocracy. They, they, they come up with the word stabilitocracy, which refers to the terms, we trade human rights for stability. And we betray human rights for stability. In digital world, this is even more dangerous, as I explained, because this could be easily manipulated. You mentioned artificial intelligence. It's not just artificial intelligence. Take a deep fake videos. This is very also dangerous. Recently, a few months ago, a company was twisted uh, and uh, accounted in that company, uh, wired legally uh, over $20 million to uh, a conference of what she believed is a real-life conference. 
except that all in the conference except her were artificial intelligence, emulating or creating the CEO. So she believed, she recorded this. She believed that she is in a conference with legitimate CEOs and she pressed the button and wired the money. So imagine now turn this into a policy and turn this into a youth, turn this into a, uh, let's say, segregated youth that they see as inequality just because someone, because of the status, because of the belonging, of the social belonging, can have more access to this, and they don't. So I believe that um, this is the future and it belongs in, it, it basically starts with us and ends with us. But the future is in, 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 our, in our children, in our youth, if we don't develop policies that will balance this advancement, okay, and uh, security and protect human rights, I think we will end up in, uh, in a very dark uh, world, I'm afraid. Thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> now, I would like to turn to uh, Your Excellency, Job. Now, usually in Africa, when we think of issues of insurgency and our until now preferred solution of inviting outsi <coughs> outsiders to come and respond to insurgencies, I think that we don't pay enough attention to questions of why is that necessary. If you look at a country like Mali, say if you look at Mozambique, if you look at the Central African Republic, what happens within their own militaries to make it essential for outsiders to come and intervene in a country that has a military? Now, if you want to tell us a little bit about what was happening inside the Malian army, to make it necessary for outsiders to come and provide a non-solution and therefore to lead again to the, the reawakening of Mali's political elite and saying, look, we now want to take charge of our own security. But what was happening before? Uh, th thank you. I think I don't want to go maybe in defining what is insurgency because some of these problems are man-made most of them are created just to create tension in our country. But what was happened before within the Malian army, so we had to recourse uh, to the foreign powers. You know, for many years, over uh, almost uh, 30 years, when we had democracy in Mali, we thought, as uh, Dr. Fukuyama said, that it was the end of the history. And we decided then to emasculate the army almost. That we don't need an army, you just need to build school, to build road, to improve the welfare of the citizen, and then, you know, democracy and peace will come by itself. So nothing has been done and, uh, to really capacitate our army. As we said in our country, if you kill uh, your dog because it's bad, the other people's dog will come to bite you. So for, for me, it's very important that our leaders, we understand that for every country, as I said, you cannot subcontract your security to others. You need to have your own capacity in place, even though we have to be conscious that security problems will not be only resolved by the army. But if you don't have an army, you will not even be in the conversation. So you need to have your army. You have to build your own army. And I'm not saying that uh, all countries will need to have their own system in place, that they don't need anybody. <coughs> As they said in the previous panel for the economy, you need to have your own army, and you have to have your own capacity, your own strategy, and you will know who I need for what. If I need the Chinese, I need the Russian, for what? So in my view, you need to have, because there was a plan to really destroy our army, we need to come back now to understand that we need to have our own capacity. Not only at the national level also, we have to be mindful. Even if every country has a perfect army, in Africa today, we don't have any regional military capacity. I know countries, outside countries like the size of South Africa are coming to help the entire continent on the military issues. We have a problem. When we had issues in the Sahel, when we belonged to the G5 Sahel, uh, as I said previously, Rwanda has been the only country to give us $1 million. But Rwanda is not the wealthiest country in Africa. It means that we lack confidence, we lack solidarity. As we are going through these challenges in the Sahel for 10 years, Africa has done a little to help us. 
So we need to understand with solidarity, we can, uh, I think, mutualize our effort. So we need to have confidence in ourselves, in our capacity to design policy, to protect ourselves, to protect our continent. In my view, it starts even at the individual level. Do you think we have the capacity to protect our people? That's my question. Thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> now, lastly, um, but not least, uh, Dr. Ruta. You raised the important issue of the necessity to get to the bottom or root causes of conflict, if we may reduce this to insurgencies. Um, within our own region here, we have multiple insurgencies that take place in uh, one country after the other. It seems to me as if our international friends are usually too impatient to want to get to the bottom of the issue. They provide what strike me as artificial solutions, or artificial non-solutions. But the question that always strikes me is this. If we realize that we need to get to the bottom of these, uh, the root causes of these conflicts, <laughs> why has it become so difficult for us to do that? Because we have insurgencies that have lasted two decades even more. Within us as Africans, and if one may use this slogan that we love to use, African solutions to Africa's problems, we have set up standby brigades, we have set up the Africa peace and security architecture and all these things, they don't seem to work. As somebody who sits in those meetings where these things get discussed, why do we Africans usually seem to be paralyzed when it comes to solving our own security issues? Thank you. Um, for us to address the root causes of all these conflicts, uh, we would not even need armies or foreign intervention, because some of these issues are related to the leadership, to governance issues, and if we need to address them, we just need to, first of all, to acknowledge them, to agree that uh, those are the, the, the root causes, to agree that we defend them, and then we sit and we address them by just having a dialogue. And uh, if we ourselves, I mean the concerned countries or concerned government, don't have the leadership which is able to agree on the root causes of a certain situation, then it will become very difficult for, for us to, to, to address them. So we could not blame external actors who are trying to give us solutions, but sometimes are just uh, dealing with the consequences of the situation when we know very well the root causes. So it comes back to the leadership, it comes back to the governance, it comes back to the responsibilities of our governments to be really in charge of the security of our people and our countries. So once again, um, we need responsible governments, we need responsible leaders who are able to look at those uh, root causes because they are known if we, uh, for example, if we look at our own region, the situation in Eastern DRC, the root causes are known and we don't even disagree on, the, on that issue. But the political will to address those root causes is the problem. And it is where issues of leadership come in. It is where governance issues come in, because sometimes there are invested interests for some of the very people who are responsible to address those issues. We talked about uh, mining, about um, uh, access to resources, and, uh, and so on and so forth. If those leaders who should address those root causes are involved in illegal mining or are the ones who are running these uh, various armed groups, how do you expect them to, to, to just to invest efforts in ending that very situation which is benefiting them. 
So it is, uh, it is all this. I, I think we need to own our own problems uh, and to just take the leadership in addressing them. Otherwise, uh, if we understand them, but you are, don't have the courage, the political will to deal with them, and we outsource the solutions to others, those others will probably bring wrong solutions to us. We cannot keep uh, complaining about the problems inherited from the colonization because we need to address them. That, but in any case, we should not expect or wait for the, colonial, the former colonial powers to come and address those, uh, those problems <coughs> for us. We need to, to address them ourselves. We don't uh, need to outsource the solutions for our problem. And uh, most important, we need to put the citizen at the center of whatever our governments are doing. Citizen-centered leadership, governance, and accountability are key if we want to address the security challenges of our continent. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Minister Diop. Your last reflections took one minute. Uh, no, uh, one minute. I think let us see ourselves always as part of the solution. Let us also have a change even in the narrative. Let us depict our, uh, stop uh, seeing ourselves as a poor country or as a poor citizen. I think because this is even, as he said, the cultural poverty, because sometimes really we need to overcome the cultural poverty. I think that's very important. Uh, we need also to really maintain hope uh, because that's a security issue in my view is foremost economic issue, because the economic and inequalities that lead to all the security issues we are facing. So let us not focus only on the military and the equipment, the capacity, but let us look at also the economic. If we invest in our youth, it's the best way to, present, to prevent conflict, not, on, not to organize workshops, but investment in the economic development and empowerment of our young people, for instance, can be a best way, in my view, uh, to project hope and uh, positivity in our continent and to better tackle uh, the security issues we are facing. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Haji. Your reflect final reflections? Okay, it would be okay if I just say I agree with the previous <laughs> speakers. Uh, I'll just say, yes, I think that um, I'll thank uh, once again for the organizers that invited me in such a distinguished event. And I would like to say that uh, there are many challenges. There are no silver bullet solutions, but I think that uh, investment in the future and sustainable uh, projects is something that basically uh, Africa needs. And uh, as they say, try to stay on the table, not to be on the menu, because uh, the, no one can solve the be uh, problems uh, better than you. And there is a saying, I think it's Arab proverb that says, better loot, uh, let the Arabs do that tolerably, than you do that for them perfectly. And I think <clears throat> it's better for Africa to do the problems by itself, of course, to filter out all the good things and to prevent all the greedy things and uh, bad things that basically try to harm her or to uh, go out of the uh, interests of African people. And finally, Brian, your final reflection. There is a Moroccan proverb that says, let's be like a tree that never changes its roots, but may change its leaves in different seasons. It's important to understand that we have repeated lies about ourselves and lies about development. One of the lies we repeat, by 2050, 75% of Africans are going to be living in urban areas. I want to challenge those of you who claim to be intellectuals. The only reasons why Africans are coming to urban areas is because we have not developed the rural areas. But all foreign capital that's coming to your countries is not investing in your urban areas. It's going to the same rural areas that you have socialized your people to believe 
They have to leave their land where there are critical minerals. They have to leave that land where there's underground water and come and be what? Homeless in the urban areas or to be vendors or to be unemployed. What are they leaving their land to for those who wish to invest in the critical minerals? I would like us to change first things first. By 2050, 75% of Africa's rural areas, which are also the repositories of critical minerals, of underground water, and of other very valuable assets, will be developed for our people to feel no need to move to overcrowded urban areas where there's a stress. Number one. Number two, women in this country have had phenomenal progress as a result of the leadership, the laws, and the policies political advancement. But women in this country and elsewhere need, with the partnership of men, to become economically empowered for three reasons. Over 60% of households in Africa now are led by females because men, my brother, many men who are responsible for the children have either died, have either gone overseas, have denied paternity, so we are raising a whole generation of the future leaders of this continent who are accustomed to rejection, to denial, and to no provisioning, right? And the people who are raising them are culturally subjected to violence. They are also politically subjected to violence, and they are socially subjected to violence. We are not doing women's economic empowerment and political empowerment as a favor. We cannot end conflict because anyone who rapes your mother, your sister, your daughter declares war of a cultural, political, spiritual, and social nature. The cyclical nature of grievance transacted in our community must accept. It's because we have transacted war on the bodies of women. Lastly, young people, I do not think that we have the luxury to talk only about youth employment and entrepreneurship. I think we now need to go beyond making agriculture sec sexy and some of the, the continent's food security, climate security, the continent's security depends on young people realizing that as this generation on this stage and other older than us die out, they will remain with the land whether agriculture is sexy or not, they will remain with the rivers whether they think it's a place to go or not. You young people, this is not about anyone making this sexy for you. For goodness sake, if you don't take the responsibility now, you will wake up very soon, you will no longer be youth, you will be adults and you won't know what to do. So stop sleepwalking, wake up, this is your continent. No one is going to give it to you, especially not the elderly leadership. You have to grab the future by the scruff of its neck. Not through only protest and demonstrations, but through applying yourself with the skills that you have, using new technologies to produce value that makes sure you are not as poor as your grandfathers or as poor as we are. Thank you. Thank you. Um, <clears throat>